I, I think it's a pleasure for us to have Chris with us today. Uh, Chris is, a, is the author of uh, the Low Tech Magazine, which is like a, a very crazy solar powered website. And hence the, the, the live status of the website depends on the weather in Barcelona. Thankfully, it's quite sunny, not like uh, Austria. Uh, and I think uh, I really liked Chris's work and I thought it would be great to have him in the, in the course as a, as a presenter. Uh, because in the course, in the workshop that I was conducting with all of you, a lot of people were talking about uh, things like, uh, like energy independence, energy dependence, and a lot of energy kind of depends on the network. And hence, we are kind of dependent on the network itself for our energy and for our information needs. And I think Chris's work in the low tech magazine uh, kind of brings in a very curious way to explore this interconnection of hours to the energy and then to the network and uh, i think it would be great that he could present all those things ab uh, about his work and in and uh, share some light on what is the process of building an internet powered website and things like that so without further ado i think uh, i'll give the floor to chris and he can take it forward thank you very much for the introduction um and thanks for being here and for inviting me. Uh, so I started Low Tech Magazine in uh, 2007, quite uh, some time ago already. And with the idea, so before I, I worked as a, a high tech journalist, say I, I did the kind of uh, uh, conventional reporting on new technologies and, and scientific um, achievements. And then I kind of started to realize that um, well, it, it, often these high-tech solutions are not really solutions. So I, I just turned everything around and, and started to focus on, on old uh, technologies, what we can learn from the past and um, how we can steer technology in a more kind of sustainable direction. And um, a very important point from the beginning was um, that with Low Tech Magazine to um, to criticize the, the vision of a, a high-tech sustainable society, which is all around us now. Uh, politicians, the um, businesses are, are all have been jumping on that train. And the idea is very simple. It's uh, let's replace fossil fuels with, with renewable energy sources and we keep on living the way that we are living today. So for example, we drive... Uh, we keep driving these heavy, uh, fast cars, but they're now powered by uh, batteries, which are charged by wind and, and solar, so they are called sustainable. Um, it's a very problematic uh, vision of the future because fundamentally uh, fossil fuels are a very different energy source from uh, wind or sun. So the, the first difference is that you need a lot more land and a lot more materials to harvest a similar amount of energy. So here you see what people call a solar farm. Um, well, if we switch to solar energy, but we don't reduce energy demand, we're going to uh, have to convert a lot of nature into uh, solar uh, farms, which are not really farms. I mean, it's not nature. It's more of an uh, industrial uh, site. I mean, more or less, it can be worse. The second problem is that fossil fuels can be used whenever we want, but wind and sun are obviously dependent on the time of the day, the weather and the seasons. And here you see uh, the power output of a, of a wind farm and the, the dark blue line in the middle is the average uh, power output. And that's what politicians and, and many scientists are, that's the data that, that they are working with. So for example, they say, okay, this farm produces on average like 250 megawatts. So it can provide power to so many households and businesses. But it's totally uh, theoretical data. Uh, in reality, as you can see every day, um, yeah, the, the, the power output of the wind farm varies and it's pretty unpredictable. So there will be many days that these households uh, and businesses don't have enough energy and other days that they have way too much. And this can be solved 
in theory again uh, by energy storage uh, for example uh, with batteries but that brings us to the third point that many of these so-called alternatives to fossil fuels are actually dependent on fossil fuels <clears throat> and that is for uh, the mining of the materials uh, running the factories uh, using the transport networks to to um, to move the components and in some cases, even like in the windmill blades, they are literally made of oil. It's it's a high tech plastic, but it's it's basically oil. So solar panels and wind turbines are not really uh, alternatives to fossil fuels. They are kind of more efficient ways to turn fossil fuels into um, electricity. I mean, more efficient depends where you put them, where you build them, etc. So. Um, I'm not against solar and wind energy, on the contrary, but I think what we first should realize is that we, if we switch from uh, uh, to a very different power source, we should also adapt our technology and our lifestyle to this new power source. And basically all the technology that we, we have now and all the, the, the whole lifestyle that we built uh, on top of fossil fuels, it's really uh, grow, grew out of 150 years of fossil fuels. And and so that is not really realistic to simply switch to a, a very different type of energy source and keep keep holding on to all these uh, things we we think we need. For example, when we talk about cars, the solution is then well we have to go back to uh, smaller cars, lighter cars, uh, less uh, fast cars, slower cars, uh, uh, less with less luxury, etc. Uh, here you see one from 1949 and it's still like it consumes as much fuel as the same car of the of of the Citroen the smallest Citroen that is for sale now so we know how to we have built much more energy efficient engines but instead of lowering the fuel use of cars what we did is we uh, just made them faster and we put them full of electronics and we made them heavier etc et now these are cars, but I'm I'm here to talk about the internet. And um, the internet for many years has been presented to us as a, a solution to many uh, sustainability problems. Uh, for example, um, that people said, well, it's um, you can if you can download music, you don't have to uh, to produce a vinyl or or a CD or things like that. And and. That may be true in some cases, but in general, what we have seen in recent years is that the Internet has become more of a problem than a solution in the sense that its uh, energy use has completely um, skyrocketed um, and seems to be out of control. So it uh, doubles every five years or, or something. It's very hard to, to calculate, actually, because it evolves so, so quickly. Um, and there's several reasons why the energy use of the internet keeps increasing. And one is the fact that the average website or other any other web application is becoming heavier all the time. And it's a bit similar to what I just explained, what happens to cars. So um, just like in with cars, if, if something gets heavier, uh, moving it from one place to another will take more energy. And the same goes for a website. If, if a website is three times heavier than it was 10 years ago, as you can see here in the graph, that means that you need uh, not three times because there's efficiency improvements, but say two times more energy to uh, to serve the website to the, the person who is uh, watching it. Uh, secondly, the time that we are online has also increased. Uh, 20 years ago, you were only on the internet occasionally to look things up. It was a whole different way of, of being connected. And nowadays, as we all can observe, once we um, uh, come out of the house, everyone's constantly connected to their uh, to the internet, thanks to uh, mobile internet and mobile devices. And then third, a third reason is... Um, all the hidden data traffic that is not about content, but rather about, um, well, capitalism at work, all the, the, the advertising, the trackers, the cookies, which also generates a lot of data traffic and um, is, is increasingly uh, 
becoming uh, problematic in itself. So the whole um, only this hidden internet traffic is already similar in size to the internet of say 10, 15 years ago. And so recently people are more aware that the internet is not a solution or not only a solution, but also a problem. And one of the um, answers to that is very predictable. And that is let's use more renewable energy. Let's power data centers with um, wind farms, with solar farms, um, etc. So this is uh, Greenpeace started this um, uh, initiative, the Clicking Clean Report, in where it ranks the, inter the biggest internet companies in terms of their use of renewable energy. And you think, ah, great, soft, we just uh, come replace the fossil fuels with uh, renewable energies and we are sustainable. But it's more complex than that, of course. Um, for example, this is the Netherlands. It's the north of the country where we have a very high concentration of uh, data centers. The authorities attracted them with, with uh, uh, big tax cuts, but mostly these companies come there because there's a lot of renewable energy available. So it's a very windy region. It's full of wind farms. And so all these data centers are, are now running on wind power. And then these companies can say, hey, we're, we're kind of we're green, we're sustainable. Uh, but the problem in these provinces where these data centers are built is that obviously the supply of renewable energy is, is, is limited. And what happened is that um, all these data centers, they sucked up the renewable energy and the households that are there and the businesses that are were there already. Yeah, they're back to fossil fuels. They're back to burning coal and, and gas and, and so on. So um, it's not really a solution just to, say, steal the renewable energy from, from someone else uh, who, who then has to go back to, to the fossil fuels. And um, as a blogger, which I mean, that's that's how it was called when I started uh, in 2007. I'm obviously part of the problem. I'm running a website for more than 15 years. Um, it has high traffic uh, to make things worse. So um, here you see my old website, uh, which was um, yeah not very sustainable, let's say. <clears throat> so I burned a lot of fossil fuels just uh, talking about uh, sustainable low-tech solutions. And my readers have always um, kind of reminded me of that contradiction. So Mr. Low-Tech, uh, you're using the internet. How can you use a high-tech thing like the internet to try to convince people to be critical of high tech? And so in 2017, I got an offer from uh, two uh, then students from RISD Academy in New York to uh, redesign the website because obviously i mean they found my website extremely ugly which they are right to to say uh, but what i thought was like well this is an opportunity to not only build a website that looks better and that works on mobile devices etc but also one that is uh, more sustainable and that is maybe low tech and what is it what is a low tech website and is it even possible? So these are Mario Tsuka and Lauren uh, Campbell. And then I also got Rule uh, on board, a friend of me who's a network artist. And so we started to um, to, to, to uh, discuss what, what it could be. And what eventually came out, it took, uh, took two years, is that uh, it's a solar powered website. So in that sense, we are following the advice from, from Greenpeace. We switched to renewable energy, but we didn't stop there. So um, it's also a self-hosted website. So it's running here in my apartment. Um, uh, so uh, self-hosted, there's no um, hosting company elsewhere. And it's also off the grid. So it means it has its own energy storage, which these data centers that you just saw on the image in the Netherlands, they don't have their own energy storage. If there's not enough wind, they're simply burning fossil fuels. And the second thing we did is to um, address all these trends that make the, the energy use of the internet grow and which I just explained. So instead of making a heavier website, we made it lighter, much lighter. And instead of um, yeah, being always online, it's not always online. 
I was I will explain more about that later. And furthermore, it has no trackers, uh, ads or cookies, whatever. So you surf it completely anonymously. There's no hidden data traffic behind the scenes. And it was a very interesting process. Actually, it is because we're still working on it and improving it. Um, because from the moment you try to uh, run a website on solar um, energy, you are confronted with limits. So you have to design within limits, and that is exactly what is missing in the wider world. So um, we think that there are no limits because fossil fuels kind of give this impression that there is an infinite, endless supply of energy uh, that you can consume as much as you want, and that energy use is not really uh, an issue. But from the moment you go, um, say uh, self-hosting a website with a solar panel you run into a lot of limits and the first limit is of course uh, the size of your balcony or whatever space you have so uh, the balcony here is like uh, five meters six meters long and that's it but it also has a lot of other uses of course you sometimes you like to sit on the terrace there are plants uh, it's space to dry the laundry so you have to kind of limit um, say like okay uh, this space of the balcony um, I'm prepared to sacrifice for my website and that was originally a 50 watt panel we switch now to a 30 watt panel um, but from the moment you have your limit the solar panel you can also not run any server on on a small solar panel like this if you run a, a conventional server on it it um, yeah it's not going to work you need to put the whole balcony full of solar panels and so we chose a very uh, lightweight uh, computer. It's an Olimex A20. And it's similar like in terms of processing power to a smartphone, an older smartphone. And there's your second limit. From the moment you have a server like that, you cannot run a WordPress, a typical WordPress site on, on a server because it would freeze immediately. It's, it's totally impossible. So we had to completely rethink like um, how to re how to build a website, one that is uh, compatible with with solar energy. And um, so this is the result. And this is the inspiration. So the the motto of low tech magazine, um, not just when it comes to the Internet, but in general is like if you are want to solve a problem, you're looking for a solution just look to the past and you will find it. And, and that has proven to be um, basically correct, whatever topic you apply it to. And I was very surprised that uh, it's also valid for, for something that uh, modern as the internet. So what you see here is the first website ever published. It's still online, you can still visit it. So early 90s or late 80s it was. And we took that, um, website as a template for our design so it's basically the same uh, whole idea of this website um, that we that we used and as you can see there were no images on the first website ever made uh, the internet started as a text medium and only later it became um, yeah the, the television that it is now and and full of images and videos and of course, we could have made it easy for ourselves and built a um, new version of Low Tech Magazine with, with only text, but that would have been a uh, suicide because the images are, are a very important part of the appeal of the website. So instead, we went for, um, again, looking into the past um, for inspiration, and we found this old school um, compression technique called dithering. It's from the time that uh, video cards had very limited colors. And so with, with this technique, you can, um, you can kind of uh, pretend that it has more colors than it actually has. Uh, yeah, it's quite technical, but um, you can read more about, about it on the website. So basically, you strip the, the images of their uh, colors. They become grayscale. Um, and then you overlay a color depending on the category that the article uh, belongs to. And that is actually the colors are chosen by the browser. So the website does not look the same 
uh, for everyone. It actually looks completely different for everyone because it's mostly the browser designing it. So before in the 90s, um, web design was mainly um, telling, yeah, it was left to the browser that, that you used. And depending on the browser that you used and your uh, settings, it looked different. And that's the same for us. So the colors that are chosen are just the colors in your browser. So they won't always be the same. Um, and also the font, for example, is different. Um, not everybody has the same font installed on their browsers. Uh, you can also change it if, if you don't like how it looks. So these are like, um, it's the same page, but on four different uh, browsers. And this also, this all, all these little, um, design choices, they save a lot of um, data traffic. For example, uh, the typical modern website um, downloads a font because they choose a specific font, but ours doesn't do that. There's no request to the server because it's the browser who decides. Uh, we did also something sim similar with the logo. So the, the old uh, logo you see below, and um, that is an image. So every time, every web page that the visitor asks for is you have to download that image. Uh, that's not the case anymore. It simply became a, um, yeah, a typographic move. So if you join uh, two signs, you get an arrow. And that is kind of referring to looking for inspiration in the past. And it's a way to have a, a logo without having to download the image. And then the most um, important uh, design choice we made was to build a static website. And um, in the 90s, all websites were static websites. And today, all websites are dynamic websites. And dynamic websites are kind of weird things in the sense that they don't really exist until the moment that you uh, ask to look at them. So, um, when you click on a link for a website, the, the, the server will very quickly build that website. Um, and that takes a lot of processing power. And why do we do that? Because we want websites to immediately reflect changes. For example, if someone comments or if someone puts a like, um, that it immediately uh, shows on the page. Uh, and that's cool, but it also uh, is very energy inefficient. You need a very um, powerful uh, server for that, especially if you have high traffic. So the more traffic you have, the, the more problematic this becomes. On the contrary, like in contrast, a static website is very simple thing. Um, and it's very um, comparable to what we have on our computer. So you basically, you open a folder, you click on a, on a document and it shows. And that's the same what happens when you visit the solar uh, version of, of Lowtech magazine. Uh, you enter this folder and you simply click on the document and it shows. And it's always there. It doesn't have to be made all over again. Uh, so the, the processing power needed for that is way, way lower than for a dynamic website. And many websites actually don't change that often. And in our case, what is the only thing that regularly changes or like every few days or, or especially after a new article is published are the comments. And so we solved that by um, introducing the, the basically going back to the letters to the editor, but then the emails to the editor. And so people send me their comment as an email, and then I paste it into the document. And uh, every 24 hours, the site regenerates and shows the most recent version. And all these little uh, design changes, um, as you can see here, they make a lot of difference. So the old website is still online for now, uh, for probably a few more months, because we're now working on um, migrating all the missing content from the old website. And the interesting thing is that we, we can now compare the, the same article on both websites. And you see just the page size, there's a huge difference here from 6.3 megabyte to only 0 0.36 megabyte. And uh, the requests to the server have diminished a lot. And uh, the site also became faster. So that's pretty much um, a kind of, uh, gift you get because it was not designed for speed it was designed for efficiency um, but still it's faster so 
uh, that's probably not going to work if you try to make uh, cars more efficient. They're not going to become faster, but the internet or website, actually you make it more sustainable, but you make it more user-friendly at the same time, which is uh, very interesting, of course. Also, the search engines, they really love uh, fast-loading websites, so it brings a lot of extra advantages. And another advantage is, uh, it brings is that uh, you're not only saving uh, energy in the network, you're also saving a lot of energy in the production of the end use devices like the laptops and the smartphones. So if everybody would build lightweight websites, we would not have to switch to a new computer every three to five years because we all know um, what happens so you you buy a laptop and five years later it kind of you have the feeling it's getting slow but actually the laptop it didn't get slower what happens is what i explained earlier is that the content on the internet is getting heavier the whole time so your laptop uh, increasingly has trouble to download these things and um, in parts of the world where people don't have these uh, fast internet connections and computers yeah the typical western website simply not accessible and um, so our website can be seen on a on a computer of 20 years old. And um, so there's no reason if why why computers would only last five years. You can really uh, do 20, 30 years, maybe forever with a, with a laptop if you stop making things heavier the, the whole time. And producing laptops and smartphones and uh, it's very energy intensive. So it's it's a big part of the of the footprint of the internet. Um, yeah, there's a very um, interesting component also. So like I said, it's off the grid, so it has a battery. And there, the battery is always a compromise between um, uptime, that is how often you want to be uh, have all the energy you want. So in our case, how, how often you want to be the website, to have the website working. And on the other hand, um, costs, like money, batteries are very expensive and have short lifetime. So you have to replace them like five, six times over the lifetime of a solar panel. And also sustainability, because every time we have to produce new batteries. And uh, so the, the biggest part, uh, the biggest part of the environmental footprint of off-grid solar installation is the battery. So um, we decided to uh, go for a very small battery and accept the fact that the website goes offline now and then. Uh, we actually uh, are online from like usually uh, March, April to November without interruption. And then in the winter time, it goes down, especially December, January, it's, um, it's less reliable. Uh, but still we got a uptime of, um, wait, I, here you see the uptime for 2020, it was, we got an uptime of 98%, which is um, quite a lot. So on the top graphic, you see the, um, every time the, the, the black line goes until the bottom, the website goes down. And the, um, the colors are like the weather, the, the yellow is sun. So you see there's a lot of sun here in summer. The blue is uh, rain and the gray is clouds. And the graph below shows even better that uh, how seasonal it is. So from, uh, yeah, for most of the summer, spring, autumn, it's online. And then in, in winter, it goes offline a lot. Now, if you have, if you reach 98% efficiency, you think like, come on, man, why don't you get 2% more and, and leave it online uh, all the time? But that's actually uh, to go from 98% to 100%. You need to uh, multiply the battery size by around seven. So you need a, seven, a battery is seven times the size. And you also need a bigger solar panel to, to charge the battery. And why is that? Because you, if you want 100% reliability, you have to uh, take into account the most unusual weather events that, uh, for example, a whole week of rain in Barcelona, which is very unusual, but it does happen. And uh, if you don't want your website to go down, you have to take these unusual weather events into account. Now, which size of battery you choose depends um, on the type of website and, of course, also on the local climate. Um, like 
Low Tech Magazine is an international website, so it cannot really go down at night uh, because of the high share of American readers. But if you have like a local website, then um, like, for instance, I also have a, a Dutch language website, which is only viewed in the Netherlands and Belgium. And there you see that after midnight, you basically have no more traffic. So a website like that could have an even smaller battery and um, just go offline every every day around midnight and then come back when the sun uh, comes up. And so here we, we made also a life cycle analysis of the, all the components uh, to kind of, um, because if people switch to a solar power website, uh, the, yeah, it's kind of you could say like, hey, we're zero emissions, but that's not true because you have to produce all the components and these components have to be replaced uh, now and then. So there's still a, a carbon footprint. And for the system we have now, it's like um, 30 watts and 168 watt hour battery. So it corresponds to like almost three liters of oil that uh, the website uses every year. So that's basically the footprint of of, uh, of low tech magazine with uh, around two million visitors a year. That um, is similar to driving a car, a small car, for like uh, fifty kilometers. Um, we cannot measure the the footprint of the old website because we yeah it's hosted somewhere else, so we don't have access to that. Now you can say it's all a bit um, drastic to maybe uh, well the, let just the website go down. That's that's far fetched. But actually, before uh, the 20th century, uh, that was the very um, normal thing to do. So we didn't invent renewable energy. Wind power, for example, has been used for for more than 2,000 years. And here you see, for instance, a, a, a sawmill from the Netherlands, 1600s. It's a wind powered factory without batteries. So it's something we don't even know today. We can only dream of it. And I got really fascinated by these machines because how could they run a whole industry on wind power if it's not always available? And uh, well, it was very simple. They, they just run their, ran their factories when it was windy. And then they they didn't when it when there was no wind and they did other work or they had a party or uh, they had uh, they did maintenance to the to the windmill. And the same happened with sailboats. So there again, we didn't invent uh, global trade. It's been going on for many centuries, and it was all uh, powered by wind without batteries. And again, sailboats, yeah, they move whenever it's windy, and uh, if not, then they they wait. So uh, what the solar powered website uh, does by going offline is not uh, that um, unusual. But of course, people are not very uh, used to it. So they get confused by websites that are not always available. So we kind of um, made some design uh, moves that helps people um, become aware of that. So first, we made a battery meter, which reflects the the storage of the battery. So there you can see like, okay, um, the website has enough energy or it has very little, I better come back another day. And then of course we have the weather report because the, the access to the website depends on the weather here in Barcelona, but it, the readers are not necessarily, I mean, just a small percentage of the readers are here. So people don't know what weather it is here. So we give it also um, on the website. And we also have to adapt. It's not just the readers. Um, whenever I publish an article in winter, especially now, I really have to look at the weather report because you don't want to publish something and send out newsletters and getting picked up by social media and then boom, you, you go down because that's a lost opportunity. So I really have to, in winter, I have to look for uh, like four or five days of, of good weather and then I publish. Also, for instance, the regeneration of the website that I mentioned earlier, it happens at four in the afternoon because that is the moment that it, the battery is most likely full already. And so um, the, the energy produced by the panel is wasted. So that is the moment to run the regeneration process, with which 
consumes a lot of energy. So um, you don't want to do that in at night or in the morning. And also the, the live statistics. So we have the server logs, which are very crude data to see what's happening on the server. Um, if you, you can make them so that they appear live, that we can see in real time how much traffic there is on the website. But again, this consumes a lot of energy. So we turn it off in winter and we run it only in summer. So in winter, I, I don't know, really know what's what's happening in real time on the website. And then as a final move, we uh, we made the printed website because, of course, after all, it's about the content. And before the Internet, we could, um, yeah, we were not living in the Stone Age. We also had um, books, for example, which are hard to beat. You can read them without electricity, without a laptop, without the Internet, without an industrial civilization. And at the same time, they became uh, the way to finance the writing of the website because um before it was advertisements but advertisements are not compatible with a static website because they are dynamic also um that doesn't mean that advertising cannot be static it could be or and it was actually but um today all systems are dynamic so um the books also now provide the income and yeah i don't know about the time i could stop here or continue a bit Um, I think uh, we can continue for five minutes and then we'll have okay. like 15 minutes for questions. Okay. Um, yeah, so when we launched the website in 2018, there was a lot of uh, feedback. I mean, it was a, a very big uh, hit in that sense. Um, and in the comments, what many people suggested that uh, you could... Act, act, that was very interesting that so many people uh, tried to um, give us advice on how to keep keep the website online for 100% of the time. So it was hard to swallow, apparently. And one idea was, why don't you put uh, servers in different parts of the planet? Because there's always the sun shining somewhere. And then a year later, um, some artists from the US actually um, built that system, the solar protocol. And... Um, yeah, they kind of changed their description by now, but in the first uh, description, they also kind of sold it as a sustainable uh, solution. But that is, of course, not true because what they did is um, overbuilding the infrastructure. So instead of having one solar panel and one server and one battery, they had eight of them on different parts of the planet. But you have to multiply all these embodied energy. So you have to build all these batteries, solar panels, servers, and so on. And then, of course, your footprint is even bigger than when you, we would just um, have a battery that's seven times larger. So it's a kind of, it's a beautiful project, but um, in terms of sustainability, it makes little sense. And we're also critical of our own pro project. So what we built here, which you, which you see here, is actually um, it works and it's maybe more efficient than the average website. But in itself, it's totally not an efficient uh, infrastructure in the sense that you build a whole energy installation for just one website. And of course, the way to do it even better is to um, run several websites on um on a server or several servers on the same solar installation, then that is, of course, the, the principle, the concept of a data center. And um, I don't have the space for to start a data center in my house because I want to keep my balcony. But um, this is where other people could take the idea. You could imagine a, a large scale data center with its own solar panels or wind turbines, depending on, on the energy source that is available locally, because here, of course, there's a lot of sun, but uh, if you go to the Netherlands, you better go for wind power of, instead of solar power. Um, and uh, then all these websites, like thousands of websites, go offline when the weather is bad, and they come back when the when the weather is uh, good again. And you could switch to renewable energies with with way more, um, yeah, w w much lower footprint than when you would want to keep everything online. And of course, it doesn't stop here either because, um, yeah, to internet router, but that's where the whole internet starts. And of course, I cannot rebuild the internet. 
And up to a certain extent, the fact that we made the website lightweight also saves energy in the internet because it takes less uh, data to send it around. But you could even think further and redesign the whole internet according to the same principle um, that every node in the system is actually solar powered and goes offline when, when the weather is bad. And that would be a very radical solution, but it actually exists in certain parts of the globe. Like in India, in certain regions, you have these community networks that have solar powered nodes without batteries. So instead of the energy, what they store is the data. And that means that, say, if you send the email, uh, imagine I send the email from Barcelona to Vienna, um, but somewhere in the Alps there is bad weather, then my email will get stored until the weather gets bet better and it continues to Vienna afterwards. So the email will always arrive, but it may take um, yeah three days or something. And that's how far you could uh, take the whole idea. I'm not saying you have to, but um, it's an option. And that's it. Great, wonderful. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Chris, for your presentation. I Thank think you. it's very enlightening to see how you take the metaphor of a website that is not completely online, yet it's online. And then I like, like the comparison between a car and and the website. I think it's it has given me a lot of food to think about. And now I think we can open the the th uh, the the room for the students to ask any questions. Okay. Could could you stop you sharing? Stop. Maybe then we'll all get ah, bigger. Yes. yes. Oh, here you are. <laughs> I I find it. Hi, I'm here. Hi. I, I find it. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I find it very interesting that such a technological project ends up being quite poetic because um, it has this rhythm and it recon you know it feels like the internet is the opposite of a natural experience right it's it's electric it's anytime any you know always it's in the dark it's interior um, it has nothing to do with the weather originally but you sort of bring it back to that sphere and um, and ask the question is it even necessarily necessary to be online? all this time is 98 percent enough uh, so I, I really like this aspect that out of um going full on on the technological side you end up with a poetic thing yeah so that is um all these people giving us advice to keep it online 100 percent of the time then we think like well we actually don't want it to be online the whole time so it's also, I think our society has a bit of a problem with um, internet addiction. Uh, like I don't have a smartphone, for example, and then people, uh, a lot of times when they see that, then people are like, oh, I also wish I would not have a smartphone, but they still have one. <laughs> so it's people- It's really interesting, yeah. Because some of the students did uh, surveys of if there was a black car, if it was one thing you would miss. and majority was coming as mobile phone yes <laughs> even before like electricity or something yeah and that's weird because of course without electricity the phone is not going to work um yeah it's it's especially weird seeing how recent the technology is that something has become a necessity in such a short time and of course it's not just I mean, it's often sold as uh, people want these things, but of what, what is happening is that uh, life is getting organized around the smartphone. So these days, if you, um, yeah, I, I mean, for everything you need a smartphone. And that also uh, means that if you don't have one like me, uh, life is becoming harder every day because um, things that are very easy through the smartphone, uh, you then have to do it in a different way. like buying a train ticket or whatever it depends on the country but in some places it, it became really uh i mean in sweden there are even places where you cannot go to the bathroom without a smartphone 
because the lock it works like that uh, yeah i mean these are very basic things that become problematic so you cannot really blame people that they need their smartphone because the whole society has been organized around the smartphone which i think is a very stupid thing in the sense that it's very much i don't think it's a good idea to um to rely on so many infrastructures and high energy use to organize very common things like paying um yeah we used to pay with cash which is a very resilient system you can uh, it doesn't need electricity or infrastructure for data but now um if the internet goes down or or the electricity network goes down yeah we, nobody can pay anymore um and 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 there is still cash now but you, you see it coming that in 10 years cash is gone and like that it's with many many things uh, so we really wanted to to send a message with this um with the fact that the website is not always online and maybe we may become more radical like we're still trying to downsize the solar panel so it's now on 30 watts and i think with 20 watts we could still have a very good uptime but i think also what's important is that um, you don't need to uh, be offline half of the year to make it sustainable. It's really just about this five percent. Like, or like if you um, if you build an off-grid solar installation for a for a house, that's also the the most used method. Um, is there like aim for the ninety five percent uptime because it's the it's the most optimal compromise between sustainability costs and uptime. So if we would, as a society, if we would accept um, the fact that 5% of the time we have no energy, like maybe not just websites, but everything, then uh, it would be very easy to switch from fossil fuels to renewable energies. Because, um, yeah, if you have wind and sun combined, that's already helping a lot. And you could actually get completely off fossil fuels. I mean, except for the fossil fuels you need to build the power plants, but um, with a very small sacrifice. And, and that I think is the most important message that it's not about uh, being half of the year in the dark. It's just about 20 days a year. And they did a study in the UK, which, which has a lot of renewable energy, but they came there uh, to like if if the english would uh, the the britons would uh, accept power shortages for 60 days a, a year like two months and that doesn't mean there is nothing of energy but not enough then um it could be self sufficient with just the windmills and the and the water wow. and the power that it has that's crazy there's a study about that um other questions? I think there are lots of could be a lot of questions because I think one of the students also did this uh, study where they found that um, the Austrians need a lot less energy than they're currently using to be in order to be happy. Actually, um, but I'm going to. I think we should get questions in or thoughts from students. Yeah, I think uh, I think uh, students might have a lot of questions, so uh, let's ask them. I have a question to the um, the thing with like sixty days for the in the um, UK where there wouldn't be energy um, with only renewable energy. Is it also um, like um, what is it called um, um, atomic energy? Is it also in this field of that should be left out or would be included? Because it's often it, I'm not sure. Sometimes people put it into the field of renewable energy or like because it doesn't produce you two that much or yeah i i think i'm i should check it but i'm quite sure that renewable energy was left out of that study so what they wanted to prove was that with just renewable energies you, which atomic power is not it's uh, maybe low emissions but it's not renewable so in that study no but uh, yeah if you ask me atomic power or nuclear power the problem a bit with that is that um, you cannot easily um, 
say what you can easily do with a coal plant is to say, okay, uh, we have enough wind available. Let's let's turn it down or just turn it off or, or put it lower. You cannot do that with a nuclear power plant. It has to kind of have stable production. So, so yeah, that kind of goes against, if, if you keep counting on, on nuclear power, you're never gonna go the other way, which is uh, completely renewable because you always have to leave this, this minimum you, you have from the nuclear power. Uh, I think I'm not a big fan of nuclear power. I don't think that's surprising. But um, at the same time, I also think that the discussion is too much focused on what type of energy source we should use. So you have all these different camps, the, the believers in wind power and solar power, and then they hate the believers in atomic power and the other way around. But it's of secondary importance. I think what is much more important is that we re reduce energy use um, and so that we reduce the, the the fossil fuels used and that is not what's happening so what, what is happening at the moment is that we are building more and more wind turbines and solar panels but the fossil fuel energy consumption is not coming down significantly what we do is extending the energy use the whole time and we keep uh adding more things to to the mix uh, both devices and and yeah more renewable powers but it's we're never gonna get anywhere unless we start focusing on reducing energy use and then what what type of energy use you're gonna use it's of secondary importance i mean you could even argue like why don't we stick with fossil fuels but we reduce our energy consumption by 90 percent you have the same result and it's just the discussion is completely uh, has a completely wrong focus according to my view. Because anyway, you, everything depends on fossil fuels. So whatever uh, the nuclear power plant, good luck building that without fossil fuels. And the same for a, a modern wind turbine. You can build an old fashioned windmill with with human power, but not a modern one. I'm having a very pragmatic question. Um, uh, how, because uh, I powered my website also solar and I have the problem in winter because offline, because the battery is outside on balcony. Uh, but do you, do you fret, how did you solve the, how do you solve this problem at night somehow? Because the battery always goes offline because it's cold. Do you have, did you have drill to the wall to uh, grab the cable from the solar cell to your living room? <laughs> yes. Or is the battery outside and then you insulate it? <laughs> okay. And also move to Barcelona. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the first point is, of course, what, what we see. There was recently a blog post about uh, some guy who built solar powered website in the Netherlands on his balcony but facing west or something so it was the most um, wrong location possible and he ended up with a 700 watt solar panel to <laughs> just to keep his website online during the winter so yeah first of all you need to to choose the energy source that is locally available and i'm not sure what it is in austria but um here it's definitely the sun uh, in the Netherlands, is definitely wind. Um, in forested areas, you could run it on a thermoelectric generator. So basically on your wood stove or any other heating uh, appliance, if you paste the thermoelectric generator or a couple of them, you can run your power, your website when you're heating or cooking. Um, and about the location of the battery, the, the battery is inside. And that's pretty important because what you say is true. Like, uh, cold temperatures really uh, reduce the storage capacity of a battery. So you should try to put it inside. And um, with the cables, well, my solution is probably not the best solution for, for Austria, but um, they are just uh, kind of, the window doesn't close completely anymore. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the cables are running through the, yeah, in between, the, it's like these uh, sliding windows. So there is a little um, gap between the window and the wall that in winter, because it can get cold here also, I kind of, um, I put um, 
some kind of cork material over it to insulate it. Uh, but yeah, you could start drilling holes through the walls, but this is not my apartment. So it's, I mean, I rent it. Um, I guess I should not drill holes through the, through the outside walls. But yes, it's better to put it inside. That's gonna um, that's gonna give you a much better uptime in winter. But of course, the problem, like the biggest problem in with solar power in more northern countries, is that the difference between summer and winter gets way larger. So here it's about four times that you have four times more sun in summer than in winter. And I know from the Netherlands, uh, because I did a calculation there also, it's 10 to 12 times difference. And I don't know how much it is in Austria, but um, I think you have a better climate than the Netherlands for sure. But it's probably also a big difference between, uh, wind, uh, between winter and summer. So you, if you run it on solar power, you're going to have to accept more downtime in winter. And in summer, it will work just as well, probably, or even better because you have more light. It's the same like in Scandinavia. Um, if you have a, if you would run a solar power website in the north of Sweden, it's going to be offline the whole winter and it's going to be online the whole summer, day and night. Perfect. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? Um, I guess no more questions. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been really, really enlightening. I was especially uh, surprised with Kega Brain Solar Protocol because that, that was one of my projects of inspiration on this project. <laughs> And I'm really quite surprised that it's actually not that sustainable because I thought people would be using existing infrastructure wherever that they could are. Be a solution. But okay. uh, it could be that it changed by now. And uh, so, I mean, we also kind of, uh, I mean, they will probably uh, have done something with our criticism. So yeah. um, if they would do that, then it would work. Yeah. And of course, if you talk about poetic, um, to making it poetic, that's what they really uh, did very well. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not kind of demolishing it. It's just that yeah. watch out by, by calling it a, a sustainable way to solve the, the uptime issue, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you cannot get around that. And that is what, what made all these comments so interesting, like all these, because this was just one example, but so many people keep sending us advice for keeping it online while... Uh, there's always a price to pay for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, think, with... I mean, I think for, for me, the strong message from your talk, and I think hopefully for the students, is something that already came out in our midterm reviews we did last week, was that it's more about using less overall. Yes. It, it, we really need to, it's not about sub, substituting with an alternative, maybe a little bit, but it's also a shift culturally and in, in infrastructurally in our lifestyles to start yes. considering yeah. an, a less use overall. And that's, of course, um, a much harder uh, message to sell than yeah. telling people, hey, you don't need to change. Uh, we will solve it yeah. for you. Because yeah. everybody agrees with that, you know. But from yeah. the moment you start questioning uh, modern lifestyle, even if it's just very limited, um, yeah. you get a lot of, uh, yeah. Yeah, but you know, it, it's just because there's no, there isn't currently, people cannot imagine anything other than what they are doing right now. Yes. But that's where I think design can play a role in helping imagining something else, which has less, use of energy and it's still people are happy and go on with very fulfilling lives yeah I, I think the website i mean okay it's not always online but um i don't really feel that low tech magazine is now worth less or yeah um, yeah i mean i didn't have that people don't complain when the website is down I never had an angry mail saying the website is down. I mean, it could come because now the old one is still online, uh, although most people don't even know that it's there. But 
um it in summer it yeah. will disappear and then it's really yeah it's gone yeah okay uh, thank you so much chris for your time you're welcome thank um, you thank you thank you take care and we'll be looking out at your work for inspiration okay great thank you chris thanks, thanks have everyone. a nice day bye everyone bye bye bye